You guys can hear me okay? It's not too loud. Not if I get excited either? Okay. Um, so uh, the title of my talk was actually Firefox OS, um, it's coming, it's here. Uh, but instead, I think that this is a better title, um, uh, Firefox OS and you. Uh, an open mobile... An open mobile experience for everyone. I'm sorry. I'm, I just arrived from Vancouver yesterday, and I'm a little bit jet-lagged. So I live in sunny Vancouver. Um, spoiler, it's not very sunny. Um, and uh, I work at Mozilla. And my role at Mozilla is on paper technical evangelist. But I think that that term actually confuses a lot of people as to what I actually do. I do spend some time traveling around giving talks like this. But most of the time, I'm interacting with developers like you, looking at your code, helping you figure out why your apps don't work, get them in the marketplace, things like that. So I spend some time uh, writing tools to help people uh, with their apps. Like right now, I'm working on a server-side Ruby module for in-app payments. And then sometimes I'm reading people's code and figuring out you know why it doesn't work and why it won't validate in the marketplace so I do a lot of different things um, and I like to tell people that because I think that the, the term evangelism is a little bit misleading um, and so I have this secret that I want to share with you today um, it's a pretty awesome secret I think and that is that you guys are all already Firefox OS developers um, and some very simple tests. I know, that's pretty exciting. You didn't even know that you totally know another platform already. Uh, and this, these simple tests will actually confirm. Um, can you write a web application? Somebody, you can put up your hands. Be proud of that. That's, that takes some skills, right? Okay, so most people in the room. Uh, bonus points. Have you implemented a responsive website before? Yeah, also? Okay, great. So you're basically all of the way there um, with, with a few small things, which I'll get to. Um, so Mozilla's goals with Firefox OS uh, was to create an open mobile operating system. Um, I'm sure any, you know, like some people have iPhones, some people have Android devices. Uh, we, Mozilla sort of felt like there's a lot of proprietary lock-in with either of those platforms. And uh, we think that there should be an op open um, operating system that people can contribute to and that is, uh, you know, very accessible on a, a wide range of devices. Um, but also we want to bring the smartphone experience to people that might not otherwise have access to it. So it's very easy for a lot of us with our, you know, nice cushy developer jobs to be able to say, okay, I'm going to buy the shiny new iPhone 7. They're announcing that right now, right? It's going to be like iPhone 6 or 7 today. Um, or, the, you know, a new Samsung Galaxy, whatever. Um, and these devices are great. I know I, I own an iPhone. It's, I, I rather like it, actually, the experience. But um, especially in my travels in this role, I've, I've really learned that most people in most countries that are not like, you know, North America and, and very well developed can't really afford an iPhone. Um, and they'll still try to. So for example, in a place like Brazil, there are tons of import taxes on an iPhone um, and it can cost you know, around like $1,000, which to us, you know, with our nice, our nice jobs and everything might not seem like a whole lot of money, but when you look at how uh, the Brazilian Real is doing and you look at actually how much people are paid per hour there, that can be uh, months of somebody's salary, like months and months of somebody's salary just to get themselves like this really nice shiny phone if they want the smartphone experience. So, you know, we thought maybe there's a way that we can bring the smartphone experience to, to more people and in uh, more locations. So, for example, uh, Spain was our first uh, launch, launch uh, country, and uh, we've rolled out there. Um, I just like this photo because I think it's cute. Um, and so the launch in Spain has, has gone pretty well, actually. They've been, I think we've sold the most phones in Spain so far. Um, we've also launched in Poland. Here's a really awesome, um, actually, I think we've got, uh, what carrier do we have in Poland? I can't remember if it's... I think it's uh, T-Mobile, actually. So we've got some pretty big carriers on board with us, but they did this really fantastic uh, billboard. Um, Venezuela and uh, also Colombia. And in quarter four, we're rolling out in uh, Hungary and also Brazil and some other countries. There's actually a really large list, and I, I can't even remember all of them, but we're, we're basically going everywhere that we can. Um, and uh, the device that m a lot of you may have seen in the wild is actually this one, the Geek's Phone Keon, which is our primary developer device. But actually now um, we have the ZTE Open available, unlocked and on eBay, uh, if any of you are interested in doing development. I actually recommend that device over this one because the ZTE Open has way better GPS uh, capability and functionality than the Geek's Phone. It's, it's still good for everything else, but... Don't, don't try doing a GPS app. Um, and um, the, sh the phones that are actually shipping to consumers, one of them is the ZT Open, which is another good reason to use it as a development device because it's actually what people are using, and the Alcatel One Touch. So these are the phones that are, uh, they're honestly, uh, 
This has not got the capabilities hardware-wise that an iPhone does or a Galaxy S does. It is a much uh, lower power device. They were designed specifically to be cheap and affordable, so we do have that constraint to work with. That being said, you can still write really awesome apps for the platform. You have to be a you know reasonable uh, you know developer with JavaScript, but it definitely can be done. And if you want to come see me later, you can see some of the apps that have been made on the phone, and, and that's definitely been proven. So. Um, you know, I'm, I'm here in Berlin, and you guys don't have Firefox OS, so why would you care to develop for it? Like, if you can't use it and put it in your pocket immediately today, like, why would you care? Um, you know, and some people will also say, like, well, you know, if it's like this web-based device, and, and I've got, like, a responsive website for... Um, you know, my, my business, uh, isn't, that, isn't that enough? Um, you know, why should I make apps for a place I don't live in? Why should I make something special and packaged for Firefox OS? Well, I mean, I would argue that, you know, being a responsive website and being on the web is good, but uh, human beings do like uh, integrated environments. Um, for a lot of day-to-day -day things, like anything that requires the doing of something, uh, like let's say checking your bank information, I personally would be much more likely to use an app for that than to have to go to navigate to a responsive website every time. Um, I, I think for frequent doings of things, having things in an integrated context and having them integrated with like your phone's operating system is actually very familiar and comfortable for people. So I think that that's an argument for making your, your application um, tailored to a particular platform or build on a platform. Um, and, uh, you know, why, why make apps for a place that you don't live? Well, money. <laughs> so even if Firefox OS isn't rolling out here, uh, one of the cool things about our ecosystem right now for, for apps in the marketplace is that um, it's still very ripe for disruption, as I guess the marketing people would say. Um, and what that means is that unlike the, um, the Apple, like uh, the, the, the app marketplace there, where discoverability is really a problem for anybody that's, that's making an app. Before I was with Mozilla, I worked at a small company called Steam Clock Software in Vancouver. Uh, if you ever want like native iOS stuff done and you want like to hire someone, you hire them because they are fantastic. Um, and uh, so working there, like we, you know, we made some apps, we put them in the store and we were really frustrated because we knew that we made really good quality apps. We could compare the performance performance and, and compare like the usability and people liked them that, that we talked to. But the discoverability of that store is terrible because um, it's, it's, it's really difficult to sort, you know, find things that are new and exciting unless you know an app particularly by name. Um, and so uh, right now, like, you know, the ecosystem is growing slowly and steadily and we're getting hundreds and hundreds more apps. But this is still early enough that if you have a really good app and you get in now that we have, uh, you know, paid app support, you can probably make some money. Like maybe you can be the big player in this, on this platform. And I think we're looking for some of those. Like we have business development off like dealing with companies like Twitter. We've already got the Twitter app and stuff like that. But I personally would like to see this as an opportunity for someone else who's a developer to make something awesome that I don't already know about. Because as discussed in the last talk, I like things that are new and shiny just as much as the next person. So I'd like to see that with our platform. There'd be like some really core apps that are that are Firefox uh, OS first and then have them be really cool. So motivation, awesome, and money. Um, and so people often ask me, they're like, well, you know, Angelina, you know, can HTML5 beat Apple and Android? And, uh, you know, like, how, how are you going to compete with them? And uh, I think that people kind of miss the point of what we're doing. We're not actually trying to directly compete with uh, Apple and Android, actually. I think we're just trying to go where they haven't. Um, uh, I think it was uh, Christian Hailman who I was talking to. He's our, our principal evangelist at Mozilla. And he had someone ask him, um, you know, what are you, you going to do when, you know, you've got all these phones out there and uh, Apple and, and Android, they decide to put out a phone that's more competitively priced and they decide to go where you've gone. And his answer was, well, then we've done our job. <laughs> then we're making more and more phones more accessible to more people. And uh, with Mozilla, that's the, actually what we want here. Um, and the interesting thing is that the, the web is becoming more and more, quote, native. I'm not even sure what that term is going to mean anymore in a few years. Um, we've got stuff like uh, Asm.js and Emscripten, which is coming to Firefox OS soon, so you can take, uh, you know, C and C++ code and, um, you know, compile it and run it in the browser. Um, and so it makes me wonder uh, what native is even going to mean anymore in, like, five years or ten years. So, funny thing, I, <laughs> during the last talk, I was like, oh, I don't know, maybe I should remove that slide. It's going to 
it's going to be uh, it's going to be a little bit of rehash. But but also we want to avoid planned or built-in obsolescence. I mean, it's really fun and exciting to have um, the the brand new shiniest thing. But actually, it's not totally necessary. And even though these phones may not have the biggest and brightest shiniest new features, um, a lot of people still use like really old feature phones. Like I was in a store today picking up a SIM card, uh, uh, you know, just so I can use the internet around here without you know extortionate roaming charges. Um, and uh, I noticed actually that people are still selling all these really old feature phones. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, well, for the same price, you know, like this is like 60 to 80 euros, depending on where you buy it from. And it's more like a smartphone than those feature phones are. Why aren't we selling that instead of, and why are people still buying these old feature phones that don't give them nearly the same kind of, uh, you know, rich experience that, um, uh, pardon me, a smartphone can. Um, so I, I do think, I mean, like this is probably not any more powerful than any of those phones, but it will still give you this interesting smartphone experience. So I, I like the idea of avoiding planned or built-in obsolescence. I think that with good apps, we can still give people kind of the new and shiny experience and that we don't necessarily have to have the best you know, the best hardware all the time or the newest, shiniest thing. Um, and on top of that, the web is like, you know, I heard someone talking about how HTML is basically stuck around and, and you know, I think it's going to for at least the foreseeable future. So I like to think that the web technology that we're, we're using in terms of like HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, how we use those might change a little bit, but those are sort of like the mainstay of web technology. So I think that that's actually a pretty, pretty safe direction for us to go in for an operating system. Um, so then sometimes people say, but I'm a web developer. I don't know how to make apps for a mobile phone. I'm not a mobile app developer. Um, and like I said, if you can write a web app, you can write a Firefox uh, OS app. And it doesn't really matter which develop or pardon me, which development environment you use, whether you're you're doing some of your development in Chrome or uh, Firefox or Safari or Opera. Who develops for Opera? Who develops an Opera here? I keep asking that because I keep hoping someone will put up their hand. I'm not trying to like dig on Opera. I just actually want to be like, hey, you. I want to know like you know what I'm missing out on because maybe they can tell me. Um, and uh, I mean, like I say, you can develop in any browser you like. Um, Firefox, so, uh, Firefox actually has, uh, of course, like a simulator add-on and stuff like that, which you'd want to use for testing your app. But you can get pretty far everywhere else. Um, and uh, you know, the Far Firefox also has this really awesome responsive design mode, which is really really great. And and actually, something that people don't know is that Firebug isn't. Well, so a lot of people still use Firebug, but you don't actually need to use it anymore. We've got some pretty great uh, developer tools that I think that people don't use because they don't know they exist, which is really kind of a tragedy. Because when I started Mozilla, it's funny, they interviewed me. They're like, oh, what, what browser do you use to develop with? And I was like, oh, God, I'm in an interview. Oh, my God. OK, what do I say? Do I say Chrome? Do I be honest or do I lie? Do I say Firefox? I use Chrome. And I like kind of just stared at my shoes for a second. They're like, no, no, we wanted you to be honest. And I was like, I told them this story about how I loved Firefox, but then it got really slow with Firebug at this one point. And I was like, oh, man, this Chrome thing has really taken off. And I kind of moved over there. But actually, I can say that since starting at Mozilla, I've, I've played with Firefox a lot more. And it's, it's actually really zippy. And if you don't use Firebug <laughs> and you use our tools, it's pretty great. So that was my obligatory developer tools plug. Um, and uh, there's lots of code to, to help uh, scaffold your project, right? Like Firefox OS is, is, we've got some APIs for you to access hardware features, which I'm going to talk about in a moment here. Um, but there's a lot of code to already scaffold your project. It's, it's framework agnostic. You can use Angular. You can use uh, Zepto. You can use uh, jQuery or not use jQuery. Um, you can use your HTML9 responsive boiler strap JavaScript. Now, hr9bs.js is a flexible, dependency-free, lightweight, device-agnostic, modular, baked-in component framework, MVC library, shoelace strap to help you kickstart your responsive CSS-based app, architecture, backbone, kitchen sink, Tweety Birds. So whatever, <laughs> whatever the hot flavor is for, um, you know, development, I'm, I'm curating Cascadia JS proposals. And let me tell you, the hot, hot frameworks right now are um, Angular, Ember, and uh, Backbone gets an honorable mention for sticking around. But those are like the hot things. And you know that next year it's totally going to be something else, right? So whatever you want to use, you can use it. You're, it's just web development. And then another, another thing people will say is like, ah, oh, but HTML can't do X. And I'm like, OK, so it can't, you know, so, so this device cannot run you know, like your latest 3D game, that's fine. Maybe that's not the problems or the things that we want to solve or try and do with this platform. So if you're trying to develop for this platform, I would say stop trying to copy native apps because they're their own thing and their own little world. Uh, you know, stop trying to homogenize the experience. Uh, a lot of people say that your app should look the same on every platform. And I'm like, no, I think your app should look what makes them look like the most sense on that platform or have a user experience that is tailored to that platform. So that's not necessarily true. Um, you know, stop buying into the hype of this planned obsolescence 
obsolescence thing. Um, HTML5 on phones is its own thing. And, um, you know, I also like to tag this one on. Don't, don't try and be super original. I know we all want to be the next, like, you know, disruptive startup and make millions of dollars. But, but really, a key to success is just try and be good. Just pick one thing and be really good at it. And that's actually what we need for apps, I think, in the marketplace. Just pick one thing and be good at it. So don't try and do this, right? Like, here's, here's, here's you trying to shove it into the box. It doesn't fit. And don't, don't do that. Um, and then people will also say, oh, but, but I don't want a restrictive ecosystem. And actually, what we've got going on with the marketplace is really not all that restrictive. I mean, we've, we don't have quite the same stringent requirements that other app stores have on our apps going in there. Um, and actually, I think that in the future, what we're going to try and do is, I mean, right now we have the marketplace for privileged apps, which uh, I'll get to in a sec. Um, and, and we have like a content security policy so that, you know, you can't just like hijack someone's phone and, and stuff like that with, a, with malicious software. Um, but what we would like to do is find a way to expand in the future so that other marketplaces that are not necessarily the Mozilla marketplace can uh, facilitate their own um, you know, content security policy stuff and that you won't, you know, you don't, we don't want you to be tied just to our marketplace in the way you might be with some other platform. We would like other people to have their own, um, their own uh, marketplaces as well and their own store and have control over that themselves. Um, and that was, I should have been in this slide already, but it will be even more open soon. And huzzah. Um, so how do you get started doing this stuff, right? Like we're all, well, you know, we're all developers or we work in some sort of a capacity uh, designing or building software and you probably want to do an internet or make an app or something like that. So getting started is really simple. Write a web application. And like I said, uh, Firefox OS is framework agnostic, so you can use your boilerplate bootstrap 7.9 or whatever. Um, you add something called an app manifest, which is basically a JSON file describing some metadata about your application so that the marketplace knows what to do with it. And then you deploy to either your servers or submit to the marketplace. And that's another thing that I should mention is I mentioned the marketplace. Um, you can actually host your app on your own server and have complete control over it. That does limit some of the APIs that you can access uh, on the device, you know, just to avoid you know, malicious uh, software being installed. But you can actually get really far with that. So if you want to have complete control over the regularity of you know, your own app updates and don't want to deal with like, the, the curation and review process of the marketplace, you can totally do that and have a valid app that people can install on their phones. So this is an example of a manifest. It really is this simple. It's just a name of your app, a description. You give a launch path, and then you specify some icons. And if you really want to, you don't have to. You can put in some developer information. Um, also in here, uh, if you're writing something that's a privileged app, you would also specify uh, some per permissions things as well. You would say, like, I would like access to um, you know, a certain API that, that I need permissions for. Um, and so we have three levels of access. We've got hosted apps, which are stored on your server. They're easy to upgrade. Like I mentioned, you have complete control over that. But they do have limited access when it comes to APIs, just for security reasons. Uh, privileged apps uh, are reviewed by the App Store. They use a content security policy, and they're hosted on a trusted server, so that when someone goes to the App Store, they have a reasonable assurance that whatever they're downloading isn't going to just you know, do something malicious to their device. And then there are certified apps, which are part of the operating system. Probably they ship on the phone. And uh, those are made by us at Mozilla and also some of our partners as well. Like, for example, one of the carriers, Telefonica, might have some specific apps that they ship on the device as well. So uh, these APIs that we have, uh, web APIs, actually get at hardware features. If you go to arewemobileyet.com, it's sort of got like some indicators for all of the hardware features that we're working on. Um, and so the things that are available to, for hosted apps, for example, are like the vibration API, the geolocation API, uh, battery status, uh, push notifications, payments, um, proximity center. What else do we got here? Um, mouse lock API, screen orientation. So, so even with just things like geolocation and, and push notifications and payments, I actually think you can get pretty far doing some localized apps that way. That's, that's actually pretty cool. Um, and as an example, bam, some code. Um, this is just like a really simple example of calculating uh, the level of the battery and then setting up some listeners so that you know when the battery level has changed. Maybe if you're in the middle of a game that you've designed, you want to set up a listener so that when it gets to be 10% or less, you can warn the user to you know, plug in their phone. Otherwise, they're going to have their game quit. And unless you have like continual save state with games, a lot of them do these days. But if you don't have that, you, know, you might want to warn them so that they can plug it in and they don't lose what they're doing. Um, and then privileged apps, so the ones that go in the marketplace, have a little bit more um, capability. Like they can access the SD, you know, the SD card, and and uh, they can, you know, call open the browser with the browser API. Um, you also get, uh, you know, the system XHR requests, the contacts API. You get a, a little bit more um, permissions with a privileged app to do stuff. 
Uh, for example, you can actually directly create a contact. This is just a quick example showing that uh, you just throw in some configuration and that you can just save it. It's, it's very, very simple. And then you've got some handlers for success and failure there. Um, certified apps have the coolest stuff, honestly. Um, and so from talking to the web security guys on Firefox OS, some of these um, things, like the mobile connection API in particular, is a big one because... Um, the mobile connection API is only available to certified apps right now, but one of the number one requests I've had from developers that are developing in places that have unpredictable weather is how can I get information about what kind of connection the user has and how can I get information about when that type of connection changes so that if I'm dealing with something over network, I can serve up appropriate assets. Like I'm not going to serve up like giant assets when I know that this person doesn't have a very good connection. And right now it's, it, we, right now we can't do that and that's a problem. So from talking to the web security uh, people, um, um, a lot of these certified apps APIs, they're working right now to sort of um, cautiously give more access to privileged apps. So some of these will actually change probably in early 2014 to give you even more, um, more access to APIs as well. And yeah, so the question is, why can't you do all of the things with privileged apps that you can't with hosted apps? It makes cats cry. Um, and of, of course, I've mentioned it already. It's just because of, of security um, and, and just keeping things safe for the end consumer who we do care about. And uh, we do have something called web activities, though, uh, which allow you to do things like call the dialer. Uh, call what's called a pick activity, which allows the user to select media on their phone. And what we're doing with these little bits of JavaScript and these web activities is we're making it so that the user has control. So you can say, hey, I want to access something on your SD card. Uh, what I want you to do is go get me an image. And you can actually have it pick an image. And so from a hosted app, you can get functionality that's much more similar to a privileged app without it necessarily being a privileged or you know certified app, respectively. So um, an example would be maybe you can actually request that you make a call. You can just pass it some information like this. And we have, we've called them Mose activities. We're hoping that they're not just called Mose activities and we can like generalize for all sorts of mobile web apps in the future. But, um, and that would actually bring up a screen that's kind of like this one back here um, and actually say, this app is trying to make a phone call. Yes, no. You know what I mean? Like, because it would be kind of crazy if apps could just phone things for you. That would, that would be weird. I wouldn't want that. Um, and then similarly, getting an image from the phone, you just say, like, I would like to do a pick activity. The data I'm looking for is this particular MIME type. And, um, and you've got success and failure handlers and stuff like that. So, um, and that will allow you to get an image from the phone. Um, so places to go, if you do get curious about this stuff and you want help, is we have the Firefox OS Marketplace, and it's sort of a developer hub. Um, that and, of course, uh, do I have something for MDN? No, this, uh, this plus MDN is basically all you could possibly need. Also, you can email me. I'm Angelina at Mozilla.com. No, I'm, I'm actually serious. I think people like hear me say that, and they think, oh, no, I don't actually want to email Angelina. I'll totally be an annoying. But... But no, you can, and I will help you with your app um, because I do this every day. So there's the developer hub, and then there's you know Mozilla Developer Network, which has a lot of great stuff. And then there's also people like me and the people on my team who are basically there to, to help you. Um, and this is really the thing that you should care about, and it's the simulator. And it's an add-on for uh, Firefox. You just go to Firefox add-ons. Actually, if you just Google for Firefox simulator, you will totally find it. It's pretty fantastic. Um, it's got live uh, CSS editing. Um, it emulates touch events properly, and, and it's not actually mouse clicks. It's got, it's got a lot of features that will basically get you a very, very far before you need to test on a device. And um, spoiler, something that's landing soon is like some more advanced uh, remote debugging. I know this because this morning I, I was excited about it. I was like, oh, I'm going to tell people. Um, but that's landing in, in like a couple weeks in um, a new version of Firefox that's coming out. So um, right now, uh, this is one of the most actively developed tools and it's getting better and better. And I'm really proud to say that actually. Um, and if you are looking to get started, and okay, maybe you're doing your Angular Bootstrap Ember 3.0, whatever, um, then uh, you might be thinking, okay, Angelina, just like you know, zipped through those code examples. How, what was that? How do I how do I do this? Um, Robert Neiman. Uh, who's also on my team, wrote this fantastic little app called the Firefox OS Boilerplate app. It's really easy to find. Just look like look for it on GitHub. Um, and he's implemented pretty much all of the APIs you can implement with hosted and privileged apps. Just very simple, minimal cases so that you can actually like 
don't actually you shouldn't actually copy paste but if you wanted to you could just copy and paste that code and it would it would basically be the minimal example for you to get started and I think that's really important because uh, these are APIs that although they're simple they're still unfamiliar to you and you need a starting point for them so this is fantastic when I started Mozilla and I was all like I don't know how how to Firefox OS this was an app that I was like oh this is fantastic I need to tell everybody about this um, and um, phone gap soon um, hosted apps on Android. Originally it was soon, now not so sure. Um, but as for PhoneGap, uh, right now we have a developer that's working on that and uh, PhoneGap, I've, I've seen photos of um, the, the PhoneGap load screen on Firefox OS devices and I think they're still ironing out a few more things. Um, one of the developers on my team, or one of the guys on my team was um, talking to the PhoneGap guys just yesterday and so that's actually coming really soon. So if you're somebody that's a PhoneGap developer and you want to be able to just you know build for Firefox OS, that support is actually, I would say, on the order of weeks away. I don't want to be too ambitious, but that was that's what was said to me at least. So if they said weeks, probably like a month, right? Because we all, we all know about software estimation, right? Um, but yeah, so there's also all, lots of really cool stuff coming down the pipeline too in 2014. Uh, Asm.js support, WebRTC, Get User Media. I'm most excited about WebRTC and Get User Media, frankly, uh, but other things like CSS3 variables and I happen to love web components, so that's important too. Um, but all this stuff is coming as well gradually as we as we roll it out and it makes its way into the platform. So anyway, that's my talk on Firefox OS. Thank you guys for having me. I have a uh, key on here with me if people want to play with it. That's totally cool. And if you have any questions, then come talk to me. I'm very social. And... This, you can tell because I'm circling, but, but this is me on Twitter. If you like pandas and you like the occasional tweet about code, that, that's me.